our speaker this morning. He uh, received his um, PhD in 2007 from Santa Barbara and spent some time as a postdoc at MIT. He's also, um, in addition to the award he's received from uh, SIAM today, uh, he also was an NSF career uh, awardee and uh, Air Force YIP awardee. And he also um, had the 2010 IEEE Control Systems Magazine Outstanding Paper Award. So uh, I look forward to hearing. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Mac. It's a pleasure to be here. I will be talking about exciting systems, hybrid systems that have continuous and discrete dynamics. Uh, they cover a fair, broad range of applications, uh, systems with impacts, like the ones that should be showing up there. For some reason, it's not showing. Hmm. OK. Let me just uh, retry this. Oh, there we go. All right, so they are so exciting that they don't want to play, but now they will. So mechanical systems have variables like position and velocity that change continuously um, in between impacts, but when impacts occur, there is a pretty fast change of the velocity, and that's typically modeled as a discontinuity. Uh, genetic networks are believed to have concentrations of proteins and genes that change continuously, but it is believed that some Boolean logic is embedded in the network, and that will give you essentially uh, decision-making and logic variable kind of change. Circuits have um, discontinuities because perhaps you have switches, like for instance in this inverter circuit right here, to convert DC voltage into AC voltage by switching between different vector fields, perhaps with some uh, well-defined logic. Uh, control of multiple body systems or complex mechanical systems might require the use of multiple controllers in order to perform a maneuver like the one up here, a controller that removes energy, another one that pumps energy into the system, and then another one that generates the stabilization of the outright configuration. And these days, uh, systems that are multi-agent systems that involve communications and controls are very prevalent, and they involve um, logic to decide where each agent should go, and also communication events that are naturally discrete events. So these are kind of the uh, scope of hybrid systems. I will be talking about some of the theory, but I wanted to just say that if you look at these type of applications, and probably some of the applications that we've been discussing through this conference, uh, they have commonalities. They have variables that change continuously and variables that change discreetly. Continuous changing variables typically are related to physical quantities, while discrete variables typically related to logic variables or timers that get reset, perhaps after some events. Um, these systems have abrupt changes in the dynamics uh, because of these events, perhaps failures, perhaps changes in the controller, uh, use a different feedback. And at the end of the day, it becomes somewhat of a complex system, okay? The, the research that we do is trying to answer the following question, how to systematically design controllers in particular, but also analyze these systems and understand the robustness of these systems. Now, these are, at the end of the day, non-smooth systems, and robustness of such systems is well known. That is a difficult question. And the way we look at this is by actually keeping the hybrid dynamics, keeping the continuous and the discrete dynamics into the system. So we don't project our complex system into a continuous time model or to a discrete time model. We keep everything in the model as much as possible. So we capture that using dynamical modeling. Then we do some analysis and design based on control theoretical tools, mainly Lepin of stability and invariance. And then we validate this type of uh, systems. So let me just say that the, over the past few years, uh, I started doing my PhD work. We have contributed to the theory of hybrid systems, and we've been looking at systems without inputs, autonomous systems. We're looking at notion of solution, stability, invariance, and robustness. That led to an article uh, in published in HWE Control System Magazine and a textbook published in Princeton University Press, co-authored with Rafael Goebel and Andy Thiel. More recently, we've been looking at systems with inputs now, so non-autonomous systems, and how to actually understand how to systematically design controllers and understand their interconnections and so on. And that's work that uh, was published this year in a book chapter in Wiley, in a book called Hybrid System with Constraints. And on the side of validation, 
uh, once you start working on this type of system, one realizes that simulating this system is not a trivial problem to solve. So we've been looking at simulation theory, and we have developed a tool that you can run in MathWorks, uh, MATLAB toolbox, and uh, it's very uh, useful for, for such validation. Let me say that all this work haven't been possible with many contribution and discussions and um, collaborations with all these people right here and my grad students. Uh, this is uh, alphabetic order. But I would like just to point out that the work with Rafael Govern and Andy Till has been instrumental to the development of these things, in particular the work uh, of systems uh, without inputs. So for what I have left of time after the crash, I would like to tell you a little bit about certain aspects of the work and then refer to some of the uh, references. I will tell you a little bit about the Lyapunov stability theory and invariance and um, how we actually model systems and apply tools that are very similar to the tools that you probably apply to your continuous time or discrete time systems. I will tell you a little bit about some of the other applications we've been looking at and then say a few words about control Lyapunov functions and invite you to a later session today. So with that being said, we can now acknowledge that hybrid systems have been around for a number of years. Um, I would like to say that 1990s was a very good year for hybrid systems. Uh, in 1998, there was the first conference called Hybrid Systems Computation and Control that took place in Berkeley, and since then, every year it has been uh, a very good meeting to understand systems that have continuous and discrete dynamics from people that are experts on computer science, control theory, and dynamical modeling, and other areas. And that work on the early 90s and early 2000 generated some very interesting results on hybrid automata, building from the idea of having finite state machines, where in each mode of the finite state machine, now you can append a differential equation. And then the transitions in between the modes, you end up with a very interesting dynamical system. It is interesting to see that uh, such combinations appear actually in earlier literature, work by Whitsenhausen, published in a Triplet Instruction Automatic Control in 1966, and also work by Tavernini on differential automata, where such structures also appear. Systems that have continuous and discrete behavior appear also in the literature of impulse differential equations. Well, there is an interesting book by Bainov and Simonov and that research was taken by other um, researchers uh, more recently. There is also uh, the appearance of systems with discontinuities on the study of non-smooth mechanical systems. Everybody would probably agree that led to measure-driven differential equations, work um, started by Moreau in 1988, and then it made its way into optimal control literature, which is a very um, uh, amenable theory for such systems, and also more structural ways to model discontinuities, like systems with unilateral constraints and complementarity systems and other non-smooth systems. So we actually build from these results, and we actually take more of a control systems perspective, trying to have hybrid systems look much more like continuous time systems that are nonlinear and discrete time systems that are nonlinear. So let me give you essentially an idea on how we do that. If you're trying to model hybrid systems and we take a state space, say Rn or some open set, and we take an initial condition, if we were looking at a continuous time system, then we will expect trajectories that are like that. So there are continuous trajectories, okay? If we were looking at a discrete time system, then we will expect trajectories that have essentially jumps and given by some type of process. And we think of hybrid systems, a combination of these two behaviors, then we can probably expect to have something like this, where you have periods of flow, then jumps, other periods of flow, jumps, perhaps multiple jumps, uh, consecutive jumps of your trajectory, and so on. So these are the type of trajectories we might probably expect of a hybrid system, okay? You can dream of possible combinations. And if we were now to think about how to generate those trajectories, then if you're kind of familiar with uh, control theory, then we might probably try to use differential equations for the flows and difference equations for the jumps. So that's essentially what we do. The continuous dynamics of the system will be given by the solutions to differential equations with right-hand side f, which we will call the flow map. And that flow map can be a function of the state of the system and of the input, let's say an input for controls. 
Now, this dynamics will be allowed to exist when my state and my input belong to a particular region of the state space, which I'm going to call uh, the flow set, and I'm going to label it as C. Every time that there is a jump in the system, I would say that that jump is instantaneous. So in other words, there is an automatic instantaneous reset of my state, and I will model that as a difference equation, where now I will have a right-hand side, which is a map G. So it will be a jump map. That's how I want to call it. And whenever the jumps occur, it has to be the case that my state and my input are satisfying a condition given by a region of the state space and the input space, which is the jump set D, okay? You might want to attach an output to this system and generate this dynamical system. Automatically, you realize that you can go back to continuous time systems when you take D to be empty and see the entire state space and the input space, and you can go to discrete time systems in the other condition when D is the entire state space and C is, on, is open. So whenever you generate some result for this type of systems, you can essentially specialize it to what we already know so we don't lose generality. One thing that we want to have is because of the analysis of perturbations that I mentioned before, because we want to have some robustness guarantees, is that we're going to replace these uh, single value maps initially as set value maps. So we're going to put inclusions right there. But again, the theory applies the same way if you have equalities. So we will have a set value map F flow map and set value map G jump map. How do we parameterize? solutions or trajectories to these systems, we are going to use two parameters, T for the continuous part, so the flow part, and J for the jump part. And this uh, J in particular will be taking value in some discrete set from 0, 1, 2, and so on. So you can think about trajectories that will look like this. If the trajectory initially flows for a particular amount of time, it will do it with J equals 0, and its domain of definition will be T from 0 to T1 cross 0, the trajectory jumps at T1, then J will be incremented by 1, and then suppose that it flows again between T1 and T2, then you have another period of flow, and you see the structure, how this will continue. So now we can put this in the picture I had before. So every time that the trajectory flows, it needs to be on the flow set, the set C, and every time that the trajectory jumps, it needs to be on the jump set, the set D. And those evolutions should be given by the equations or the inclusions that I mentioned before, okay? So one thing that you can do now is to plot this trajectory as a function of time, now hybrid time, T and J. We will have periods of flow, and then jump, and flow, jump, perhaps two jumps at the same time. And then the green region will correspond to the domain of the trajectory that will be what we call the hybrid time domain of the trajectory. So these are essentially um, how the trajectories are going to be given. And the one thing that you can probably realize is that if you craft C and Ds that are somewhat overlapping in this picture, then you might have non-unique behavior in the intersection. And, but that's going to happen regardless once you start looking at perturbations that are modeled as worst-case inflations of these sets. And I will tell you a little bit more about that later. So let me give you an example that I would like to uh, illustrate some of these modeling techniques. This is a generic regulatory network with two genes, capital A and capital B, each of them encoding for a protein, lowercase a and lowercase b. Okay, this diagram here is a diagram that biologists know very well about. To us, this implies that if the um, protein concentration A grows beyond a threshold, then the uh, gene concentration B will start growing, and this is because of, there is an arrow right here that triggers um, expression of that gene. However, if now the protein concentration B grows, then that will imply a decrease of the gene concentration A because of this connection here is a flathead generated an inhibition. It turns out that these transitions occur because of thresholds, at least it's believed that it occurs because of thresholds, and those thresholds have hysteresis, okay? So in other words, to go from inhibition to, trans, um, to uh, expression, then it's a different value than going from expression to inhibition. So actually you have some type of uh, memory effect right there. If we for a minute simplify this model and say that the effect on gene concentrations uh, is directly or instantaneously on protein concentrations, then we can come up with a two-dimensional model that I can illustrate, but larger dimensional models can be actually written. So let me just give you that. Essentially, we're going to be looking at binary hysteresis, 
we're going to be associating a logic variable to each uh, protein concentration, and it will be zero if it is inhibit, or it will be one if it is express, okay? And this is here the binary um, hysteresis model. So from the perspective of B, the protein concentration B, what we will have is the following. If QA is equal to zero, then essentially B will decrease exponentially according to the rate of decay gamma B, okay? If now A gets larger or equal than this threshold right here, the upper threshold, then what you should be doing now is to um, trigger the expression of that concentration, and that happens by changing QA from zero to one, so there will be a, the jump map will be flipping the value of QA, and automatically, because of this term appearing right here, you will end up with this um, rate of growth, KB, entering into the picture, and that will actually generate a steady-state value that is positive. On the other hand, when Q is equal to 1, especially around this upper branch, and if A becomes less or equal than the minimum threshold, then you will have a transition from 1 to 0, and that will be, again, the condition for jumping, and the new value of the state, the logic variable after the jump. Since the concentrations are uh, continuous time variables, they don't change discretely, so their new value after the jump will be equal to the previous value, so there will be the identity map for that. So you can now think about this as a hybrid system where this is the flow map for the B concentration. The same will look like for the A concentration. This is the jump set for the case of Q equals zero. This is the jump set for the case of Q equal one. And this will be the jump map for the QA, the same type of structure for the QB. And now if you look at trajectories of this system, then you can look at uh, cases where things change. Uh, for instance, in this case, the trajectory starts right here. It, it is the case that the concentration A decreases and then eventually start growing and the concentration B decreases eventually and they converge to a single equilibrium isolated point and the logic variables reach a steady state of your system. So that's pretty simple. But now you can craft a different set of parameters for these constants and get something interesting like the following. You can actually obtain that for every initial condition, the trajectories of your system converge to this limit cycle that is a rhomboid in the concentration space, but in the full state spaces, in a four-dimensional space where each of these uh, pieces of the rhomboid is in a different slice for a different combination of logic variables. So you end up with a limit cycle on a hybrid system. And one thing that you can actually try to understand is whether you have global asymptotic stability of that configuration. And something that is interesting is that in that configuration, there is no equilibrium point inside the limit cycle that you have for continuous time systems. So you're interested in a periodic orbit, and in that situation then you can think about a kind of a finite state machine model, if you will, where you transition between the four different combinations of your logic variables. So another type of uh, system that is actually a switch system, and I will tell you a little bit about all the models we can capture with this uh, framework, is a boost converter. It's a circuit that has the purpose of amplifying or generating a larger this value of the output. And these circuits are becoming more prevalent with the current power systems research in the literature. It's essentially a circuit that has two s switches, okay? One is static, this S, and another one is dynamic. So this essentially depends on the current of the inductor and of the voltage at the output. And uh, you can have full controllability of this switch right here, okay? So typically one controls this using PWM to generate such type of uh, amplified output. So I'll show you how to do a hybrid in a few slides, but it's not difficult to agree that now you can consider all possible combinations of these two switches and end up with a system that has essentially four different modes of operation, switch off, dial on, switch on, dial off, and so on. And one thing that you realize once you look at the circuit too long as we did is that Mode two and mode one are the most important pieces. Essentially what happens is that during mode two, um, essentially you store energy on the inductor and you use the capacitor to supply the required voltage at the output. And then when you switch to mode one, essentially what you do is to put in series the voltage of the input and the voltage of the inductor, which is reversed because trying, it's trying to uh, maintain the same current. And then you can actually amplify or generate a larger voltage at the output. Okay? So essentially, in a steady state, you will switch between these two modes of operation. And these are essentially trans transient states of your system. In any case, we can model this as a hybrid system where now we will have S as an input. Okay? And uh, this will be essentially a piecewise uh, 
ODE, which again could be a hybrid system. It doesn't really necessarily have jumps on the state, but when the switch is off, then you get these two differential equations coming from the circuit loss, and when the switch is off, then you get this other differential equation. Okay, so now you could apply 34 non-smooth systems, but we're going to do is to apply 34 hybrid systems where the controller will be hybrid, and our goal is for this switch system to design a control law that will regulate voltage and current to a desired value, namely find a feedback such that the feedback assigns the value of the switch, and that feedback depends on the variables of the circuit, uh, VC and IL, and also perhaps a state of the controller that can change dynamically, perhaps in a hybrid fashion, to asymptotically stabilize this uh, set of desired uh, values, okay? So with this uh, being said, we can probably dream of multiple or different models for hybrid systems. Uh, we can model switch systems in particular. They are not truly hybrid, but they are non-smooth, like in the circuit I just mentioned before. But perhaps when you do control or you specialize the switching signal to a particular class of switching signals, then you can come up with a hybrid model we can look at differential algebraic equations where you have differential equation that depends on a state and also algebraic variables. And those algebraic variables actually define a constraint according to some uh, function. Um, once you uh, put this in the context of hybrid systems, essentially this constraint can be embedded into the flow set of your system, okay? And changing between the different uh, configuration of the constraint could be part of the jump part. Impulse systems, truly hybrid systems, where you're typically given a sequence of times that you should jump, and during flows, you flow according to a differential equation, and then at jumps, you reset your state, perhaps using right continuous functions for the solutions of the system. Or hybrid automata, as I mentioned before, systems that have multiple modes of operation, where you can switch between the different modes according to certain laws, and in each mode, you have a particular differential equation that depends on the state. So now that we kind of walk through some of the examples and what we mean by hybrid systems, now we can study our control problem. So given a system, a plant to be controlled and now it's hybrid, and given a set, which is the type of uh, objects you would like to stabilize, not necessarily equilibrium point, but larger uh, set of points than that, we would like to design a feedback law such that A is an asymptotically stable set. Okay? So by asymptotic stability, we mean two properties. First, stability, start close, stay close. And if this is the set that we are trying to stabilize, we will have the property that for every epsilon, there exists a delta, such that for every solution that starts within delta of the set A, the trajectory stays within epsilon, even though you might have jumps of the system, but you need to stay in that epsilon neighborhood. Okay, so a standard uh, Lyapunov of stability. For the attractivity part, we would like to have the property that solutions actually converge to the set A if they exist for arbitrary large T or arbitrary large J, okay? So that will be a situation where that happens. And the set of points from where you start and you have such property will be the basin of attraction for attractivity, okay? So with that being said, now we can look at our perhaps two classes of feedback loss. We can look at static feedback loss, which is a function of the state, or if we were doing output feedback, a function of the output. And also dynamic feedbacks, functions that are functions of the state and functions of some other state, C, of the controller. Well, now the controller state, C, could change in a hybrid fashion by itself. Suppose that now you require to do that. So then you end up with an interconnection of a hybrid plan with a hybrid controller that yields a closed-loop system that is hybrid. But in any case, even in the static case, because of the structure of the plan being hybrid, you end up with a system that has uh, no inputs. If U is all the control input you have, and this state Z will correspond the resulting feedback, uh, closed-loop feedback uh, state, which will be X if you have static feedback, or will be the stack of the uh, plant state and of the controller state if you're doing dynamic feedback, and this H still that will correspond to the closed-loop system to analyze, okay? So now that we probably are looking at closed-loop systems, now we can apply results for uh, systems without inputs, and then you can apply something like Lyapunov stability theorem. So it's uh, by now, uh, a theorem is overdue in this slide, so just let me give you the first one. If you're given a hybrid system H tilde with a state Z, so this system has no inputs, so you can write it as a hybrid system, okay? And you're given a compact set A, 
subset of a state space, then probably your goal is to come up with a way to prove that it's asymptotically stable, both stability and attractivity. So one way to do that is to look for a function v, so-called Lyapunov function, such that v is continuous and positive definitely with respect to the set you want to stabilize. V is continuously differentiable on an open set containing the flow set, so you can take derivatives on every point of the flow set. And then one thing you want to have is that the change of that V along flows is less or equal than zero, that is, this inner product is less or equal than zero for each point in the flow set and for every possible direction of your flow map. And when you jump, the change of your V function, which is given by this quantity, is less or equal than zero for every point in the jump set and for every possible landing point or resulting value of the state after the jump. It turns out that when these conditions are true, then this implies stability, start close, stay close. Now, if you want to prove the attractivity part, then you need to insist on a strict negativity of these two quantities away from the set you want to stabilize. So, in other words, these are conditions that resemble very closely what will be for purely continuous time systems, so the blue part, or what will be for purely discrete time systems, for the red part. And now, for hybrid systems, this is no more than a combination of the two. Okay? It doesn't require checking any trajectories. It's just infinitesimal conditions. But it does imply the property that if now you evaluate your Lyapunov function along the trajectories of this hybrid system, then you get the property that you have a strict decay during flows and during jumps, okay? Now, once you look at this picture, you probably say, well, I could probably get away with a function that grows a little bit during flows, but then decreases enough during jumps, or the other way around, and those relaxed conditions are possible and very useful for applications, because sometimes finding a strict level of functions, even for purely nonlinear control systems, are actually um, difficult. One other relaxation that you would like to have is one that says, well, let's just not insist on the strict negativity and try to do something when we have a less or equal than zero condition, okay? So essentially trying to go into the LaSalle or invariance principles type of arena where now you can compute invariance uh, sets. In order to do that, you need to put some conditions on this uh, jump map, jump set, flow map, and flow set, which so far haven't been uh, assumed to have any particular property. So let me tell you what those conditions will be. If you are looking at the case of single value maps, then what we call the hybrid basic conditions, which is the conditions that enable what I'm going to tell you in the next few slides, are as follows. C and D needs to be closed sets, and F and G needs to be continuous functions. If now you're looking at the set value case, now we are going to ask that the flow map is an RSM semi-continuous set value map, it's locally bounded, non-empty, and convex for each point in the flow set. And for the jump map, we would like to have that is outer semi-continuous, locally bounded, and non-empty for each point in the jump set. Checking outer semi-continuity is something that can be done by looking at the graphs of the maps. So for instance, I'm plotting it here for a particular uh, G tilde map. If the graph is closed, then the function is outer semi-continuous, and that's the case for the one on the right, where the origin is equal to minus one or one, but on the left, the piece at the bottom is not a closed set, so the graph is not closed. So in this case, it would be having the outer semi-continuity property. So with these properties in mind, again, that can be checked without checking any type of trajectory, so whatever, you just check your constructions. If the constructions for your system do not satisfy these conditions, then you can probably try to regularize it and come up with a model that satisfies these conditions and then might want to understand what happens with solutions. Um, but in any case, what we can do now is to go back to the Lyapunov theorem and try to combine it with an invariance property. We will have the same properties as before up to this point, but now we're going to add the hybrid basic conditions on these objects. That will automatically give you stability, as we did before, even without the hybrid basic conditions. The attractivity part could come from the following property. If one can prove that no solution remains on a mu level set with mu larger than zero for arbitrary large t or arbitrary large j, then A will be a set that is attractive, and hence, because of the stability already proven, it will be asymptotically stable. 
Okay, so this is a result that requires checking for some solutions. Okay, but this is not a very difficult property to check, uh, uh, as you probably imagine. One other thing that you can do, and let me just say this is just an invariance property. One other thing that you can do because of the hybrid basic conditions is to now look at the effect on the trajectories of your system. And uh, I shall summarize one of them. It's a very important property that was instrumental in improving many of the things we were able to prove. And it's the following. It's the so-called sequential compactness. If you have a hybrid system H tilde satisfying the hybrid basic conditions, and now you're given a sequence of solutions that is bounded, and each element is a maximal solution, meaning that you cannot extend it any further due to flowing or due to jumping, then there will exist a subsequence that graphically converges to a solution of the hybrid system itself. Okay? And by graphical convergence, we mean the distance between the graphs converges to zero, and the picture that is right here is actually telling you that this is one trajectory, and the lighter one is another trajectory. They are not point-wise close, but they are graphically close, and that's because um, they're neighborhoods, or there are neighborhoods that include each other of the trajectories. But notice that it will be very restrictive to impose that they are point-wise close because the jump times, because of the small perturbations on the initial conditions, will not necessarily coincide for every dynamical system that is hybrid. Once you have this property, one thing that now you can do is to look at the following object, the omega limit set of a solution. So if you have a solution that is bounded and exists for arbitrarily t or arbitrarily j, this is the notion of completeness. Then if you have the hybrid basic conditions, it follows that the set of all possible accumulation points of that solution, which is the so-called omega limit set, is non-empty, is compact, and is invariant. Okay? Actually, it's the smallest closed set that the trajectory will approach. And actually, this is instrumental part of proving invariance principles, is where the omega limit set of a trajectory will be. So with this particular property, we can now look at the so-called invariance principle for hybrid systems. So we will go back to the assumptions that we had before. Now only the less or equal conditions. Now what you can do is to say that for every bounded and complete solution to this system, we have that it converges to the largest invariance set inside the set of points where the variation of video flows is equal to zero, union, where the variation of the function v at jumps is equal to zero, okay? And let me not tell you a little bit about this, but this is essentially the standard Lasalle's invariance principle for continuous time systems when you look at this set. This is for the discrete time systems, and this is the no more than the combination of the two, okay? And again, these are infinitesimal quantities that are given right here. Now, certainly, if you're going to stay invariant on a set, you need to stay on a level set of your level of functions, so you want to intersect that with that level set as done in the book by LaSalle in 1968. Another consequence of this, which is very important for feedback control and to get some type of robustness, is that now, if you have a hybrid system H tilde, and you now pick a continuous function sigma that defines what is called a sigma perturbation, we can now perturb in an outer way or a worst case fashion our original system to define an H tilde sigma, where now essentially what we are doing is looking at our original, let's say, flow set and then enlarging it by some function sigma of the state uh, by this inflation, okay? So this will be an inflated version of my original set. This will be an inflated version of my original jump set following the same technique. And then the vector field will be inflated on the argument, and it will be inflated on the directions of the vector field. So this will correspond to measurement noise or state noise, and it will correspond to a model dynamics that can be upper bounded by a function of a state, similarly for the jump part. And then for these systems, you have the following property. If you have proven that A is an asymptotically stable set for the hybrid system without perturbations, okay, nominal analysis, and if the system satisfies the hybrid basic conditions, then you can assure that there exists a small enough outer perturbation or sigma perturbation function such that the set A will be semi-globally, in other words, for every compact set, practically for every epsilon that you want to stay close to the set A that you want to stabilize, asymptotically stable. Okay, so trajectory will start in a compact set, will converge to a neighborhood of the set A that you want to stabilize with these perturbations. Okay? Now, this is an existence result. It's good to know there exists such function, and 
can be computed for certain systems, and we've done that, and uh, uh, it's very useful. There are other consequences of these hybrid basic conditions that I won't get to, but they are very useful. Uh, closeness between solutions and boundary horizon holds under those conditions. Uh, very important, these sufficient conditions in the Lyapunov theorem are actually necessary sufficient conditions. There's actually a converse theorem for this. And uh, that implies that if you prove asymptotic stability of the set A, by some method, then there exists a function that is strictly decreasing during flows and strictly decreasing during jumps, as long as you have the hybrid basic conditions. To some extent, this is saying that if you are proving the asymptotic stability using the relaxation I mentioned earlier, that you might grow during flows and then decrease enough during jumps, so that's not a strict Lyapunov function, but you prove the asymptotic stability, then this result tells you that there exists a strict Lyapunov function that you could probably look for, or at least use it for proofs. There are links between generalized solutions, the so-called Philip of Krasovsky, Herm solutions, and noise, very important results for discontinuous time systems, and uh, properties on structural uh, properties of phase of attractions and attractivity that I won't get to. But in any case, now we can go back to the boost converter that I mentioned earlier, and then decide how to control this system, okay? How much time do you have? Two minutes? Hybrid time, or? Four minutes. Perfect. So we can now look at the boost converter and then say, well, I'm going to have a logic variable that switch my switch, the static switch between on and off, and I'm going to use some function, gamma zero and gamma one, to do that switch. And let me just say that we can construct that function looking at a function V that essentially is a distance between the desired voltage and a distance between the desired current weighted appropriately with the circuit constants. If you take the derivative of that function, then you can define this gamma zero and gamma one function as a function of the logic variable state C. Since this function doesn't depend on the logic variable, then it will be a weak Lyapunov function. But what is interesting is that these functions vanish on this line, and above that are negative, below positive, Gamma 1 vanishes on this line, below is negative, above is positive. So then you can use a very tempted strategy that says, if I'm above this line, I'm going to use the off condition. When I hit this boundary, I'm going to use the on condition. And then I can converge to my desired VC star and IL star asymptotically, perhaps with quite a bit of jumps. But then you can invoke the robustness result to relax the switching conditions and now get essentially a semi-global practical result where now you can generate a gap between those two and obtain uh, synthetic stability that is practical. Now, for this particular example, we can actually com compute very well all these sets and all the perturbations and get some kind of constructive results. So now you can come back to this um, exciting picture. So you can probably think about jump maps here given by Newton's restitution law between two bodies, no more than that. Uh, I mentioned about the genetic network. You can actually prove that there, is, there exists a Lyapunov function and there is a global attractivity to this periodic orbit for that range of parameters. And moreover, now you can put perturbations on the thresholds and on the dynamics and still have semi-global practically attractivity of a limit cycle, which is quite exciting, and then prove some type of um, stability with multiple links and coordinated systems. We will look in some at the experimental issues of this. They are very difficult problems. And we actually very successful at generating some juggling patterns following a trajectory tracking control for hybrid systems. Uh, more recently, we were looking at underactuated vehicles, which relates to the previous talk about having attitude control. Attitude control is a, is a topologically abstracted problem, and hybrid control can solve such problems using switching. And then we were looking at control of neurons, where you can probably get into a synchronized fashion from a very bad initial condition, or a desynchronized fashion after some time. And that's actually a pretty interesting problem from um, neuroscience and Parkinson's disease studies. So let me just invite you to a later session today at 10.30, where I will be talking about more constructive ways to design controllers, preliminary results on control Lyapunov functions that can be used to design these feedbacks much more constructively. And that will also lead also to minimum point-wise normal stabilizers. This is uh, today at Eton, uh, starting at 10.30, uh, will be a number of talks about variational analysis in dynamics and control. And my talk will be at some point, but there will be a, a talk by Andy Till on hybrid stochastic systems. Uh, let me just say that there are numerous open problems. This is one of the areas that was brought about 
on the looking forward session, hybrid systems, stochastic systems, systems with switches, their problems on interconnections, state estimation, computation of these trajectories are somewhat difficult. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Actually, over time. Um, so I'll thank the speaker again, please.